Well, this morning I, I woke up, uh, my hotel where I was staying, I could actually see the swamp from my hotel, and by the swamp I mean where they play football at UF, and I got a text from my son because it's Father's Day, and I want to show you a picture of my two boys. I'm six foot three. Look at those boys. My wife is five foot four. She gave birth to two Philistines. That's a year ago. My, old, my youngest son, who is the tallest one, his name is Jojo. He's on my, my right. Joseph, we call him Jojo. He's an inch taller than that now, and he is going to be a junior. He just finished his sophomore year in high school. He's just 16 years old. Um, he's a football player and a basketball player. And I don't know what God's will is for his life, but you know, I should start praying and prophesying that he's going to get recruited to play football at UF because that would give me a reason to come down here during the fall. I could just come over and worship and hear you preach on Sundays, Mark. And my son, Jacob, who is on my left, you're right. He's 19. He just finished his first year of college at Anderson University. And um, for three years now, he's been preaching Every time he preaches, people get saved. Every time he opens his mouth, the joy of Christ just pours out of him. Both of my boys love their mama, and they love Jesus, and they love the church. I got a text this morning. I want to read this to you so I can get all up in my fields, all right? I'm an emotional person, and I cry a lot. I got this text from my oldest son this morning, Jacob. He says, happy Father's Day, Daddy. I love you so much. You're the best dad I could ask for, and I truly do mean that. You are loving, you are encouraging, you are kind, you are stern, you are strong, you are a great leader, you are gifted, you exude the love of Christ, you are funny, you are my role model. I love you so much, and I'm thankful for you. I'm praying for you today, and I know that God is going to do great things through you. None of us deserve to be used by God, but God made a great choice in choosing you. I got that from my boy this morning. And as I, as I enter into this message, I want to tell you one of the reasons why that means so much to me on Father's Day is because 10 years ago today, on Father's Day, I preached my dad's funeral. That's why Father's Day for me is so important. It's so emotional for me. It's a day I'll never forget. Father's Day marked me a decade ago because a decade ago, I got to preach a message honoring my earthly father after he had gone to meet my heavenly father. It's also special for me because I'm adopted. And ironically enough, my dad that raised me, uh, his name was Joe. I didn't know anything about my uh, biological family until after my mom and dad had both passed away. So by the age of 39, I felt like an orphan again. Didn't know a whole lot about my family growing up. Didn't know much at all, if anything, really about my biological family. But I did a DNA test. When I took this DNA test, I was able to locate my biological family. My biological mom and dad had both passed away. And as I got to find out about my biological family, my dad's name was Frankie. Uh, my dad was six foot three. Uh, my dad could say, as, according to his brother, uh, who told me, he said, I've been watching you preach online. You're pretty good at what you do. You're a lot like your dad. I was like, well, tell me about Frankie. I never got to meet him. And the first word that came out of his mouth about my biological dad, he said he could sell an ice maker to an Eskimo. <laughs> and so as I am unpacking all of this history about my biological mom, my biological dad, I'm finding out more about who I am, even genetically, it occurred to me that we really, none of us, none of us has a perfect daddy, and that's okay. There is no such thing. But what I want to do today is I want to talk about the perfect father. There is a difference because we're talking about two different people. When I think about my dad, and I had two of them, one that I knew and one that I never met, neither one of those men were perfect. But today I want to show you what Jesus had to say about his heavenly father. Because if you want to know what God is like, if you want to experience God in your life, if you want to really know what he looks like, what he acts like, what he thinks like, what he values, how he treats people, if you want to know 
God as he truly is, then you need to listen to what Jesus says about God. And what does Jesus say about God? He encapsulates it and and encapsulates his his entire definition of who God is with one word, Father. That's why Father's Day is such a big deal. So in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to read some verses to you about our Heavenly Father. And I want to show you what Jesus had to say about him And at the end of this message today, here's what I know is going to happen. We're going to see people have their hearts opened up to the love of God. And we're going to see people today, in the next 27 minutes, we're going to see people come to faith in Christ. We're going to see fathers give their lives to God. We're going to see moms and children give their lives to God. And for all of us, we're going to get a clearer, more beautiful, spectacular view of who God is and what God is like because we can know him as Father. Here's what Jesus has to say about his heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read this to you. It'll also be up on the screens. Verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For, and this is a promise, everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now watch what Jesus does here. To help us see a clearer view of what God, our Heavenly Father, is really like. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father... In heaven, give good things to those who ask him. Therefore, in light of what Jesus just said, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them, for this is the law and the prophets. There is so much here, but in the time I have, I want to show you four simple truths. Number one, Write it down if you think you'll forget it. Tattoo it on your soul. Pray for God to lodge this truth in your heart. No one has a perfect dad, but we all have a perfect father. No one has a perfect dad. No one. So I want to let the dads off the hook for a second. I know sometimes dads are like, don't get in my face. Don't confront me. Don't tell me what I need to be doing different. I'm doing all I can to do my job, to love my family. And I want you to know, if you came to Campus Church today and you're a dad, there is nothing here today but love and honor and respect for you, sir. Thank you for all the sacrifices you've made that nobody knows about, that nobody sees. But I know in in our culture, there there tends to be this kind of um, idea that women struggle with insecurity more than men. I don't believe that. I think men struggle with insecurity just as much as women do. Let me just put it to you this way. I do. What a blessing that as a father, I don't have to be perfect. When Jesus says this here in Matthew chapter 7, these words, when you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, what Jesus is saying there is, there is no perfect father. All of us are broken. My dad, when I preached his funeral 10 years ago today, I was honest, and I said, my dad was not a perfect man. He wasn't raised in a perfect family. My dad's dad walked out on my dad when my dad was 10 years old. As a result of that, my dad struggled with anger. My dad struggled with rage. My dad had a short fuse. I grew up on a farm, and I'm telling you, I watched my dad almost tear a tractor apart with an Allen wrench. He would get so mad sometimes. And my dad was not perfect, but what my dad did do is my dad showed me who God was because he was faithful to my mom, because he provided for the family, because he worked hard. He also raised us in church. I actually posted about this on Instagram just this morning. My dad taught us that God and his church were priorities. 
And on Sundays, like it's kind of a foreign concept for me when some people on Saturday night as a family are like, what are we going to do tomorrow? There was never a question in my house what we were going to do. If it was Sunday, everything else could wait. The NASCAR race was after church as long as the NASCAR race was on and my dad could watch it, he was happy. But there was never a question about where are we going to go to the lake, where are we going to go to the beach, where are we going to just lay out and have a day off. No, we prioritize church. As, as imperfect as my dad was, he had a perfect heavenly father that was the model for the way he raised us. And so dads, I want to encourage you. You don't have to be perfect. When my dad died, I drove away from the funeral home and my wife was in the front seat with me and my kids were in the back seat and I just preached my dad's funeral on Father's Day and my heart felt like it had been struck by a bolt of lightning because at 39 years old, my mom was dead, my dad was dead, my dad had been dying for about five years. He had heart disease, he was diabetic, he had multiple heart attacks, he had triple bypass surgery. I'd spent weeks with him in the hospital, literally staying up with him, weeks in the hospital. And after this long, slow process of him gradually dying, he finally went home to be with the Lord. And all of the the emotions I had been holding back, I was trying to tough it out. I was trying to be there for him. I have a brother. My brother was not involved because my brother struggles with drug addiction. My brother was barely even made it to the funeral. I felt like I was all alone. I felt like I I didn't have a dad anymore to encourage me or to talk to. And the Spirit of God spoke so clearly to me. And dads, I want to encourage you with this before I move on to point number two. God spoke to me in my heart and he said, son, you have nothing to prove and no one to impress because I fully know you and I fully love you. And when I look back at the course of my life, 49 years, I can tell you with absolute clarity, that moment, that revelation where I realized I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I don't have to earn my heavenly father's love. I don't have to work to make my heavenly father notice me. When I mess up, I fess up. He forgives me and I get up and I do it again. When that happens to me, I know I don't have to hide from my heavenly father when I mess up. I run to my heavenly father and I crawl up in his lap and I tell him I'm sorry and I ask him to help me do better the next time. And what I have in my life now is an intimacy with my heavenly father that I did not know before. And that is what life is literally all about an intimacy with God. Fathers, daddies in the house, I know you've blown it. I know you've messed up. So have I. I know that some of you struggle with anger. I know that some of you have a wound in your soul because your dad wasn't there or he was kind of there or he was there but not emotionally there for you. I know that some of you struggle with pornography and lust, that some of you get frustrated in your marriage and you look at your children and you wish you had done things differently. And some of you, you listen to the enemy tell you you haven't made enough money, you're not successful enough, you're not significant enough. God could never be proud of you because look at all the mistakes in your past. I want to call out those lies for what they are. They are demonic. They are destructive. Your father loves you. Your heavenly father gave his son so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be redeemed, so that you could be saved. And if you could, dads, If you could just let the Spirit of God take that heavy burden off of your shoulders today, I'm telling you, there is a freedom and a liberty on the other side of your salvation that you can walk in that is the most enjoyable thing in all of life. But you've got to understand, you're not perfect, but your Heavenly Father is. There is no perfect daddy, but we all have a perfect Heavenly Father. He gives good gifts to his children. And that's what Jesus goes on to explain in this passage. Point number two, the father wants you to ask so that he can give. That's what Jesus says right here. Ask and it will be given to you. 
How many of you remember when your kids were little and they were in the question stage? Anybody have kids in the question stage right now? Can you raise your hand? We're going to pray and fast for you. <laughs> the question stage. Man, I can remember it. I, 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 I wasn't going to tell this story, but then when I got here today, I remember how cool Canvas Church is. And I also know that because of Pastor Mark preaching here, I can say pretty much anything and y'all are cool with it. So... <laughs> My kids had tons of questions, and they were constantly asking. We homeschooled our kids for seven years before we sent them to public school um, to be reprobates. I'm just kidding. I love public school. I went to public school. My kids did too. But when they were little, they had so many questions. They would ask all the time. And the most important question that they would ask was always, why? I'd tell them something, why, why, why? One morning, my wife is upstairs homeschooling our kids, and she sent them downstairs into our basement to watch Something on PBS about wildebeests. It was part of the curriculum. I'm in my office, literally just a few feet away from the flat screen TV. My kids at that point were, I think, five and eight years old. Is that right? No, or four and seven. Anyway, they're watching this thing on PBS, and it was part of their curriculum. And I overhear this guy in a British accent narrating what's going on. It was the mating habits of wildebeests in Africa. I'm not really paying a whole lot of attention. But all of a sudden, I hear one of my children go, what's he doing to her? His, his brother, my other son said, looks like they're wrestling. Jacob goes, from behind? That's weird. I'm just telling you what happened, y'all. My other son says, pause it. <laughs> I kid you not. So at this point, I'm up and I'm like peering out from the door. I want to see what in the world they're doing. They literally pause the TV and they walk up under the flat screen and they're doing this. It's like they're trying to see 3D. And then J Jacob, my oldest, goes, daddy. And I was literally right there like, what? He goes, I have some questions. That was the day I fixed them from asking me questions about the birds and the bees because I just decided I'm diving in head first. And I told them the whole story. And then Jacob goes, you mean you and mama do that? I said, we sure do. He said, and then he, he just kept asking questions. He said, why? I'm like, you'll understand one of these days. <laughs> and then he goes, and then he kind of shivered. He goes, oh, y'all did that twice. <laughs> I was like, this morning, what? <laughs> do do y'all put this on the internet? Do y'all stream your services live? <laughs> Whoo, I'm sweating. <laughs> It's, so I guess the point I'm trying to say is, I mean, what was I trying to say? <laughs> I've lost the plot. You know as a mom or a dad, your kids have questions. The worst question is the one they don't ask you. I'm at a point in my life with my children now, I love it when they ask me for things. Because they know that's my daddy, he can provide. That's my daddy. He'll come pick me up if my Jeep breaks down. Am I in trouble? I'll call my daddy. Do I need advice? I'll call my dad. Do I need wisdom? I'll ask my dad. Your father wants you to ask so that he can give. It, it gives me joy to bless my children. I love blessing my boys. There's nothing in life I love more other than blessing my wife. I want to give Good things to my kids. Can I ask you a question? Moms and dads, young men, young women, single people, can I ask you a question? If God gave you today every single thing you've been asking him for, today, how would it change your life? Because that's a great way for you to come to reality of exactly how much you're asking God for.
Some of you, let me get real specific for the dads too. Some of you are afraid to ask God for anything because you were raised to work hard and you want to earn it all on your own. You know, the gospel is not opposed to effort. The gospel is opposed to earning. I'm all about effort. God wants you to work hard, dad. God wants you to put effort into your family, your marriage, your children. But what God doesn't want you to do is try to earn his love. You can't. It's already there. It's a free gift. So what are you asking God for right now? What are you praying for right now? What are you asking God to do for you right now? What are you asking God to do for your children right now? When my wife was pregnant with Jacob, I would lay in bed at night and I would put my hand on her stomach and the two of us would pray together that God would call Jacob to preach the gospel. I never once told Jacob, I think you're called to preach the gospel. I didn't want to call him. I wanted God to call him. There are way too many pastors and preachers and leaders out there. Their mama or their grandma called them into ministry and God never called them to preach and they always end up flaming out or burning out. I wanted my son to be called by his heavenly father, not his earthly father, to follow Jesus and preach the gospel. And he comes in our house. He'd been to Israel for a couple of weeks. He was 16 years old, walks in the front door, hadn't seen him in two weeks, sits down with my wife and I and says, I need to talk to y'all. I gotta tell you what God did for me in Israel. That was three years ago this week, he walks in and says, I was in a parking lot of a hotel in the Holy Land when the Spirit of God said, you were born to preach the gospel. You don't have to be afraid. I asked God for that. And I saw God do it. What are you asking your father for right now? You can ask him. You're not bothering him. It's amazing to me how many people have this misconception that if I ask God for something, he's going to be frustrated with me. He's never frustrated with you. God is never too busy to listen to you when you need something. If every single thing I had been praying for was given to me right now, today, I need to ask myself, how would that change my life and the lives of people around me? Dad, you need help raising your kids? Ask God for wisdom. You need help understanding your wife? Ask God for wisdom. You need a little more money in the bank because you've got some things you want to be able to do for your kid's college or your grandkids or you want to get debt free. Ask God to help you be better with your money. Do you struggle sometimes with your choices, your habits? Ask God to help you. Ask him. He wants to give you something good. If you need a loaf of bread, he won't trick you and give you a stone. If you need a fish to eat, he won't trick you and give you a snake. He's a good father and he wants you to ask, which brings me to point number three. The father wants you to seek so he can be found. The father wants you to seek. This is for the dads, this is for the moms, this is for the grandparents, this is for the teenagers. I've noticed, um, maybe it's because of social media, but so many people tend to get so frustrated when they don't get what they want and they immediately question God. You know what God wants us to do? God wants us to seek him for his sake. Anything he gives us beyond himself, that's a fringe benefit. The treasure is getting a relationship with your father. So let me ask you a question, dads. Are you seeking God on a daily basis? Are you seeking him? Do, do, you, do you spend time every single day reading your Bible? Because don't tell me that God doesn't speak to you if your Bible stays shut on your desk for a week at a time. Don't tell me that God hadn't spoken to you in years when if I looked at your phone or you looked at my phone and you realized how much time or I realized how much time you spend on your phone doing work, answering emails, Facebook posts, scrolling Instagram, and I'm not spending three minutes a day reading the word of God. God wants you to seek him because he wants you to find him. My wife and I have been married for 23 years. I took my wife to, a, a, was last month, I took her to the Dominican Republic for a few days. And it was a last minute thing and we got away and we got down there. And I told her on the way down there, I was like, you know, we've been dating for 25 years and I love you now more than I've ever loved you. And she said something to me on that vacation. She said, it makes me feel so valuable when I know that you seek ways to make our marriage better. Don't you love it when someone encourages you? Don't you love it when someone seeks out ways to bless you? Don't you love it, Dad, even though you've got 14 ties? If your four-year-old gives you a tie for Father's Day, 
It's like, that might be the ugliest dang tie you've ever seen in your life. You wouldn't put that thing on a dog in a parade, but you will treasure that tie. Why? Because your child was seeking a way to bless you and communicate, I love you. Do you know that you, listen, you and I, this blows my mind, we have the ability to bless our heavenly father when we simply seek him for a few minutes every day when there are so many other things out there we could be seeking. You know what I've been doing for, uh, we've got some investments like I'm sure most of you do. And for several years, I wake up every morning and I get up early, 5 a.m. usually. And typically by 5.30, I'm seeking out what my investments did the previous day. I've stopped doing that recently because I didn't want to die of depression. (laughs) Every morning, I seek out a few things on my phone. I wake up and I check the weather. I want to know what's it going to be like today. What's it going to feel like today? Should I wear long sleeves or short sleeves? Every day I get up, I open email, I seek out. Is there something I need to handle today? I look at the calendar that my assistant puts on my phone. Okay, where do I need to be today? I'm seeking those things out. So many times while I'm doing that, my Bible is sitting right there on my desk beside me, closed. And I go throughout my day and I get busy and I forget What my heavenly father wants from me is nothing from me. What my heavenly father wants is something for me. He wants intimacy with me. He wants intimacy with you. Do you want to be a better dad, dads? Study the best father. And the best father is God. And if you want to be a better dad, you got to study the perfect father. And you can't know the perfect father unless you read his book. It's the best advice I could give you as a dad. It's the best encouragement I could give you as a father. Your father wants you to seek him because he wants to be found. And then fourth and finally, straight from Matthew chapter 7, the father wants you to knock so he can answer. The father wants you to come to him. The father wants you to to approach him. And that's why in a few minutes when I give an invitation... Some of you for the first time are actually going to approach your heavenly father and say, I know you love me and I'm going to give you my life because you love me unconditionally. I've got an open door policy I always have with my kids. Um, I don't know if any of y'all struggle with ADD or ADHD. I don't. Uh, I don't struggle with it. I love it. It's, I don't struggle with it at all. I enjoy it. Every bit of it. I don't even have ADHD. I got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And and so um, I'm easily distracted. Y'all know if you live in America, there are distractions. Sometimes I want to crush my phone under my boot because the notifications just keep popping up. And somebody's like, turn them off. I'm like, I don't know how to turn them off. You do it. But distractions are a part of life. I, when my children were born, my wife and I made a rule that unless we were in like some kind of serious pastoral counseling if, if, if I was on the phone, if I was working on the computer, if I'm working on a sermon, if I'm writing a book, whatever I'm doing, when our children need something, they know that we will not blow them off. Now, if they're just coming to goof off, if they're coming for some reason that's really not important, that, that's an exception. But our children, we've told them this for years, if you need something, you are our priority. I'm going to take you back to the words of Jesus. If you fathers who are evil and imperfect and broken, if you fathers know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your heavenly father give you if you ask? God wants you to knock because he wants you to walk through that door, sit down with him, and have a relationship. There's a crisis in America you're like, which one? There's a lot, right? I mean, take your pick. Throw a rock, you'll hit 10, 10 issues. But I'm going to tell you something I'm passionate about. Maybe this is one of the reasons why you and I become so close, Mark. I'm passionate about men. I'm passionate about men following Jesus. I'm passionate about men being who God called them to be. But I also know that we live in a culture where there is a crisis. Men get a bad rap. Men get canceled. Men get criticized. I mean, I would, 
I would dare you to try to find any network TV program where fathers are portrayed as competent, confident, and good. Most of the time, if you just watch network TV, whether it's a sitcom or a movie, if there is a dad, the dad is portrayed as a stupid doofus who literally can't put his shoes on. What I want to tell you men is, that might be the way the culture portrays men. That might be the way the culture talks about you as a dad, but that's not what your heavenly father thinks about you. Your heavenly father loves you. Your heavenly father gave his best gift in Jesus Christ to die on the cross to save you from your sins. And no matter how many mistakes that we've made as dads, no matter how many times we've dropped the ball, no matter how imperfect we have been, our heavenly father is there and he just wants you to ask. He just wants you to seek. He just wants you to knock because when you knock, your father opens the door and he invites you in to have a relationship with him. As a matter of fact, when I found my biological family, did, did the research through Ancestry.com. Thank you, Mormons. The Mormons developed that. I don't know if you knew that. Did the research, found my biological family. And um, one of my cousins on my dad's side, my dad, Frankie, who died before I met him, he called me up one day. He goes, hey, I've been doing a lot of the research. Uh, now that we have your DNA, you're not the first preacher in the family. Your great, great, great grandfather was a was an evangelist, a circuit-riding Methodist evangelist. Rode a horse and preached all up and down the coast of Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. And his son, um, Furman, gave his life to Christ when he was 10 years old and became a pastor of churches in Virginia and North Carolina. He goes, oh, and by the way, there's another preacher you're related to. You're not the first preacher in the family. You know, Frankie Martin was your dad. And he goes, I'm going to send you a picture of this guy. You may have heard of him before. And he sends me a picture. And I, I look at my phone. And uh, if you were here two weeks ago, you met my cousin, Joby Martin. <laughs> Literally. For five years, people kept telling me, you got to meet Joby Martin. Y'all are just alike. Bald, beards, <laughs> camouflage, killing stuff and eating it, driving trucks, wearing a lot of denim big, loud, and I'm like, I need to meet this guy. Turns out he is literally my third cousin. <laughs> Blew my mind. But I think the thing I'm really trying to drive home to you right here is this. DNA don't lie. And if you know Jesus Christ, you have the DNA of your heavenly father in you. You are more than a conqueror. You are not a mistake. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to be perfect. If you know Jesus Christ, the DNA of your heavenly father is in you and you will look like him. You will act like him. And, and, and over the course of time, as you follow him, you will become more like him in every single way. I guess what I'm really trying to say to you on Father's Day is this. God loves you. Mistakes and all. And if you will ask, if you will seek, if you'll just knock, he'll open the door and invite you in because he's already done it. He did it through Jesus.